stand and worship with us today.
I want you to be very intentional about what I'm about to ask you to do, okay? Be very intentional. If you have your Bible with you, I want you to hold your Bible. If you have your phone, tablet, whatever you have, your copy of the Word of God, I want you to hold it tightly for just a moment, okay? I want you to hold it. Let's let the choir get down. I want you to hold that book. I want you to hold that book. Boys and girls, those of you that are in here, most of them are in their gathering place in the gym and, and I, I'm so excited about what God is about to do with them they've been on a journey they've been on a road trip through Peggy and her team they've been on a road trip through this book and I wish you could see what your boys and girls are experiencing this morning in the gym because they're at the pearly gates right now as I speak they're about to go into heaven. They've taken the whole journey through the Word of God. And so though I am so thrilled to be in here with you, a big part of my heart is in the other building with those boys and girls because they've gone through the, they've gone through the rough and the rugged, the valleys and the mountains. And now then, our boys and girls, through this book, have experienced the journey of life. They've been on a road trip, and right now, they're about to experience as close as they can with the power of the Holy Spirit. They're about to experience what the end result is to those who believe this book and those that believe in Jesus. And so, while I want you to pray that we would have an experience with God, and while I want you to pray that every lost person, and they're here right now in this room, while I want you to pray that every lost person under the sound of my voice would be saved within the next few minutes, I want you to also pray that God would just manifest himself to the boys and girls and to the adults that are in the gym right now as they talk about heaven. Here, here's why I wanted you to be intentional and get the Bible. I want you to hold it and I want you to remind yourself of something, okay? This is the holy inspired Word of God. This is the infallible Word of God. And many of you have already looked at your bulletin and you know that I'm going to be reading from Luke chapter 17 in just a minute. But let me, don't just flip there, all right? Don't just flip there like it's a literature book. Remind, be intentional. You and I are about to experience the breath of God. You and I are about to experience the God breathe word so it does not matter if I stutter or stammer it does not matter how I present the message you and I are about to hear the breath of God and with that if you believe that would you stand in honor of him here's what the Bible says Luke chapter 17 in verse number 11 if you've not found that yet just pause wherever you are and turn there after I read it, okay? Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, verse 11, Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then, as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and they said to Jesus, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourself to the priest. So it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them... Let me, let me read that again. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned with a loud voice, glorified God. And he fell down on his 
face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Father, may your word come alive in us. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you see that one little six-letter word right there in verse 16. Thanks. It's just six little letters, but my, what a powerful message when it's delivered with sincerity. I was thinking about my stepdad this morning. My stepdad taught me many things, but one thing that he taught me, I can still hear his words when he would say, I appreciate you. Man, when he would express appreciation, gratitude, or thanks. It did something in me. And I guess the reason I remember him doing it more so than anybody else is because there is a difference in sincere gratitude and appreciation and just habitually saying thank you. Rudyard Kipling, many of you know his writings, he was an author and he made, he made a fortune just tying words together. He wrote such books as The Jungle Books, Captain Courageous, and How the Leopard Got His Spots. One day, a reporter came to Rudyard Kipling and he said, Mr. Kipling, I am told that if you average out all the books that you have written, that every word, this is, this is many, many years ago, every word you have written thus far, it equals about $100 per word. And this reporter reached in his pocket, and he pulled out a $100 bill and said, Mr. Kipling, I want you to give me one of your $100 words. And Rudyard Kipling reached out, he took the hundred dollar bill, and he put it in his pocket, and he walked away, and he said, thanks. Well, uh, that one word, six little letters, hey, it delivers a very powerful message, but I want you to know that it also delivers a powerful message when it is not used, when we are ungrateful, when we develop what our society has developed today called entitlement, then all of a sudden that powerful message is delivered and it is delivered as hurt, it is delivered as taking for granted, or it is used to ignore what a person has done. Here's what I propose to you this morning, and I want to ask you to let it to sink, sink deep in your heart. Did you know that ingratitude, when you and I are not grateful for what God has done for us, it is, as we're going to see in just a minute, more dangerous than never being healed in the first place. Now, it'll all make sense if you'll just let me do something. I want to use the story of the ten lepers in comparison to our lives. I just simply want to take these ten men and look at the condition that they were in, and I want to point out some commonalities, if you will, some things that we have in common with these ten men. And I pray that at the end of this message, we will decide what our response is going to be. I put uh, several titles on today's sermon, but the main title I want you to think about as we work toward the end is a common response. You see, everybody in the room, 
will respond to the goodness of God one way or another within the next few minutes. And I pray that we learn a great lesson. First of all, I want you to see from our text, and, and this is very familiar to us, especially the last two or three years, verse number 12. The first commonality that we have with these ten leprous men is that we share in common a common affliction. Last Sunday morning, if you were here, the Spirit of God manifests Himself in a way that many of us have not experienced in a long, long while. Many of us have been waking up during the night, and, and I did this morning as well, and I believe I did every morning this week, singing that song, I speak the name of Jesus over you. Many of you have been singing that song, and, and you, you, you've learned the words of that song, and in that song, it speaks about dark affliction. Dark affliction is illustrated best by these ten men. Now, you and I can't relate. We can, we can relate to cancer, can't we, Barry? We can relate to all kinds of physical ailments, but you and I, we can't, when we're reading the Bible, really fully understand the plague known as leprosy. But all through the Bible, God's, the breathed Word of God talks to us about leprosy because it was indeed an affliction. And so, when we look at these ten men, I pray that every person in this room will allow God to show you what we have in common with their affliction. In verse number 12, uh, it says they stood at a distance. We didn't know until 2020 what really social distancing was. We didn't know until COVID-19 that uh, social distancing is not something new, but it's something that has been uh, recorded throughout history. Well, a leper is one that would have to social distance. A leper was someone that was marked and even thought to be cursed by God. And so you and I have a hard time relating to that because we live in a culture that has so watered down our sin and our lifestyle that we think we have nothing in common with them. But the truth of the matter is, church, and if we don't accomplish anything else in this sermon, I'll stop with this one point if we need to. I need to tell you that according to the Word of God, because of our sin, we are, we are afflicted. Because of our sin, we are condemned. Because of our sin, you and I will be eternally separated from God until we understand the severity of our condition. Until we understand, and here's a word that, that, that some are scared to use, how depraved and damned we are because of our sin, you and I will never be grateful. These ten men realized that they were dying. These ten men had so much more than an irritating rash. These men were thought to be cursed from Almighty God by all the Jews. They had a death sentence more than they had an illness. Let me ask you something. When you think about your sin, when you think about before salvation, and those of you that are here, that you've never been born again, there's never been a change in your life, you may have been baptized, you may have... You may be religious, but as far as the condition of your heart, your sinful heart being forgiven, that's never happened. When you think about sin, do you realize how serious and how hopeless it is? You see, when I look at these ten men, they were dying. 
When I look at these ten men, I see hopelessness and desperation. And I, with my voice, that's all I have, with my testimony, my life, my purpose this morning is to help you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, realize that you and I are in the same condition. It all started in the garden. I, I won't trace from Genesis to the Revelation, but let me share with you a couple of verses. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. So, God drove man out. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, He stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. So, look, because of sin, because of our affliction, you and I were separated from God. We're driven away from God. Now, religion can be a cheap substitute. Religion is like a counterfeit hope. And so, many even in this room right now, you've gone through motions that have tried to bring you back to, to God. But as we're going to see in just a second, our condition, just like them, requires more than just behavior modification. I, I, our condition requires a miracle that took place on the cross as Jesus was crucified, buried, and then resurrected. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says it best and many if not most of you have memorized it. The Bible says for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But then Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12 says remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. Excluded from the commonwealth of Israel strangers to the covenant promises, having no hope without God in the world. Now, now this morning, take that in for just a second, all right? Th this morning, we have a commonality with these ten men in that before Jesus Christ, we have no hope. The gravity of sin's affliction is best represented by looking at these ten desperate men. Now, I want to I use an illustration here that I know can be mistaken, and, and I pray that you will not allow that to take place. But I've seen something, and you've seen something over these last two plus years that I want to ask you to consider, what if? What if we dealt with sin the same way we dealt with COVID-19? What if we put the resources and the effort and the sacrifice? What, what, I, he, here's my burden and here's my concern. And I'm trying to take deep breaths so that I don't get worked up, alright? I, I want you to know I love you and I really don't want to deal with this all week with everybody sharing uh, your, your um, uh, 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 displeasure in what I'm saying. But uh, we, we make such a big deal over a pandemic, and yet we entertain ourselves with sin. We will wear masks, we will stay away from public, we will do everything it takes to keep from getting a disease, and yet we'll take our remote control and we will entertain ourselves and dabble in sin. One can take your body, and the other can damn your soul. And as I look at these ten leprous men, they had no hope. As I look at my life and your life, we had no hope. We shared a common affliction. Number two, 
Not only do I see the commonality of the affliction, but I also see the commonality of the need. Look at verse 13. These ten leprous men raised their voices. Now I know we all have different personalities. In this room, there's those of you that are quiet. and In this room, uh, we're all different, different people. But let me tell you something. When you hit the bottom, uh, let me stand on this side. Uh, when, when you get to the place that you know that you have no hope, and that you're dying, and that you're damned, and no amount of behavior modification or doing good can, can help you, when you get to this point, your personality and preferences is thrown out of the window. These ten men, knowing that they were dying, they cried out with a loud voice. Oh, we, we preachers do everything that we can to coax and to convince and to beg you. And here's a line that we preachers often use. See if this sounds familiar. I want everybody in this room, don't do it, I'm, I'm using this as an example. I want everybody in this room to bow your head and close your eyes. Now if you're here this morning... And you know that you're lost. If you're here this morning. And you want Jesus to come into your life. Now let me promise you. Nobody's looking. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be scared. Nobody's looking. If you want Jesus to come into your life. I want you to slip your hand up. Nobody's looking. And so we coax. And we calm. And we convince you, and, and here's what we do unintentionally. We teach you to fly under the radar. We teach you that nobody has to know your private business. Now then, you put that hand right back down. And nobody will know that but me and you. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what I know about these ten men. These ten men didn't care who was looking. These ten men didn't care what anybody else thought. Here's what they knew. They knew they were dead men walking. They knew that they were desperate men. And they knew that their only hope was Jesus. Now notice what their need was. This is so important. It goes back to what I tried to say at the introduction. You would think that they would cry out for healing. But they did not cry out for healing. They raised their voices. Now, now if there's one person in this room that you can relate to this, please grab a hold of this. They raised their voices and they said, Oh, Master, have mercy. Have mercy on me. I meet a lot of people that, and, and you're in this room. Some of you are in this room right now. You say, Lord, Master, please give me a miracle. Many of you would beg for a miracle and, and you'd ask me, Oh, preacher, pray that God would heal my body. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's many that are dealing with doubt right now because of all that's going on in the world. And they would say, Jesus, Master, give us a sign. How many of you, before you make decisions, you have to see something visible. Before you will give, before you will go, before you will make a move, you say, oh, Jesus, if you'll just give me a sign. Give me a sign. Give me a miracle. How many of you have enemies in your life? Maybe an addiction. Maybe a person. And you say, oh Jesus, Master, if you would just crush my enemies. Dear Jesus, if you would just take away my addiction. But as we look at these ten men, here's what we have in common with them. They didn't say, Master... He lies. They said, Master, have mercy on us. Mercy is not getting 
what we deserve. And these ten men asked Jesus for mercy. This morning, is there anyone watching online? Is there anyone in this room that you would be willing to say in this special moment, Jesus Master, have mercy on me. Here's some good news from Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4. Either turn there or remember Ephesians 4 verse Ephesians 2 verse 4, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love which he loved us even when we were dead in our tres- transgressions made us alive Together with Christ Jesus, God, rich in mercy. Well, verse 14 talks about their faith. What did Jesus say? When these desperate men cried out to Jesus, well, what do we have in common with these desperate men? They said, Master, have mercy on us. When you and I come to the place that we say, Jesus, have mercy on us. I want you to notice what Jesus said and what Jesus did not say. It is so much more understandable to us when when we imagine that Jesus laid His hands on their head and said, You're healed. We preachers dramatize things and we've watched it on TV where, where, where there's been a healing or a, a faith healer and he, and he stands and hey, was it earnest? Oh, earnest, angelly. And he would, he would hit him on the head and say, you're healed. Jesus, Jesus didn't do any of that. Jesus did not even say you're healed. He gave them instructions and this is what he said. Go, show yourself to the priest. Now what do we have in common with this story? What do we have in common with these men? What, what, what can we learn from the way Jesus interacted with them? Ladies and gentlemen, you don't need a man to lay his hand on you. You don't need somebody to declare that you're healed. Here's what we learn from this story. These ten lepers, in obedience, started making their way to the priest. What what is God asking you to do? Now, you've got in your mind what you want Him to do. You've got in your mind how you want Him to do it. But what is God asking you to do it may not even seem related but here's the point it was while they were being obedient that one of them looked down and he noticed that his skin was beginning to clear up and then all of a sudden he he looked at his buddy and maybe a face that was beginning to deteriorate because of leprosy. His face began to clear. And as these ten men obediently made their way to the priest, through their obedience, their miracle was made whole. This morning... It takes faith to believe in salvation. Listen to what John says. John 5 verse 24. Truly, truly I say unto you. He who hears my words. And believes him who sent me. Has eternal life. That that takes faith. to, To believe and to trust. It takes faith. And then. How about living in peace in this chaotic world? It takes faith to believe what John chapter 14 verse 27 says. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world 
gives, give I unto you. Don't let your heart be troubled, but believe in me. This morning, God is looking for those of us who have a common faith. A common faith that says, no matter who gets elected, we are still dependent upon God. A faith that says, no matter what new chemo, no matter what new treatment, no matter, hey, no matter what new vaccine they come out with, apart from faith, this Christian life is hopeless. And these men had faith enough that instead of debating and trying to figure it out, they obediently made their way to the priest. And when they got there, they found out that the miracle had taken place. Well, I want to close with the most baffling. I I want you to remember that on your bulletin, though, just two numbers, all right? I know we walk away, and sometime on Monday morning, somebody will say, Phil, what did you preach? And so, I'll be honest, sometimes I'm like, I don't even remember what I preached, all right? And so don't feel bad when you don't. But I want you to remember, if nothing else, nine, one. Nine, one. And I want to talk to you as we close about a common response. We understand a common affliction. We are desperate. We understand a common need. We don't need healing. We need mercy. We we, we understand a, a common faith apart from God. It is impossible to please God. And faith requires action. That is obedience. But... But as we move into this week, a common response, the Bible says, now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorified God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to God. Would you look at those verses for just a minute? Just a minute as I close. He acknowledged that he had been healed. I ask you at the beginning of the sermon to... To be intentional. I want you to be intentional again. Engaged. Not not waiting for whatever's next in the service. I want you to be right here in this moment. Can you honestly acknowledge. That I once was lost. Do you remember that? Can everybody here this morning. Remember Being lost. Or have you always just been. I, I, I hear this answer a lot. And it disturbs me. It, it troubles me. Oh I, I've always. I've always been a Christian. My mom and daddy. Helped establish Leatherwood. I, I, I've, all, I've always been a Christian. No. You have not. No, you have not. And if you can't remember your lostness, if you can't remember... Now, now Davis, I I see you sitting there, and and I see when I look at you, I see two people. Me, and I see my son Caleb. I mean, the personality, I understand. When I look at you, Davis, I, I know you probably, you probably don't have the story that people in this room, but but... Even a good boy, even a good boy remembers 
what it was like to not know Jesus. This one man acknowledged, I've been healed. He acknowledged it, and then he made an effort. Sir, what if I ask you, and I'm just pointing up there, so I'm not really pointing at anybody. All right, so let me point over here. Sir, sir, sir what, what effort, other than you getting in the car and driving to church occasionally, what effort are you putting into building the kingdom of God? What effort? Are you putting in, this man, he acknowledged and he turned around and he made an effort to go back to Jesus. And then, unashamedly, with a loud voice, he glorified the Master. He fell at his feet. This morning, after Sunday school, and Tim, well done. Tim taught our class today. and I love small group. I, I love hearing the Word of God taught. I slipped out of Sunday school early. Not Tim, I didn't have a meeting. I slipped out of Sunday school early because I needed to climb down in the floor of my office and glorify God. Before I got down on the rug, there's a window in my office. Do you know what I caught myself doing? I caught myself lining myself up so that no one would see me. And I had the foolish thought of that that would embarrass me if someone saw me prostrate before the Master. How dare we? How dare we be so full of pride that we don't acknowledge I once was lost. How dare we not make every effort, no matter what it takes, to turn around and say, God, use me. And how dare we be embarrassed at our gratitude. Well, commonalities, one, Glorified Him, praised Him, and ten, nine rather. Nine went through a list of things that I, I believe that we often say. One might have said, well, I wanted, to wait. I wanted to make sure I was really healed. Uh, one might have said, I, I wanted to make sure it would last. One might have said, hey, I'll go back and see Jesus later. And the list goes on, but one might have said, um, I would have probably got well anyway. Jesus asked a very powerful question in this story. And the question was, were there not Another way to ask that question may be, where are the nine? This Thanksgiving, 2022, I pray that we never forget the commonalities, but I pray above all else that our response would be represented with this one man who turned, he glorified. He humbled himself. And he gave 
thanks. Let's pray. Father, again, of all, of all the sermon that I'm most burdened about, it's the way we, the church, handle sin. Even this morning,